So as president of Caltech, it's my great pleasure to formally welcome you uh, to campus. I saw a number of you last evening, and I'll see uh, the graduate students at our home uh, Wednesday evening, and we're very much looking forward to that. Uh, the first time I came to Caltech, and I'll date myself here, was in 1976, uh, visiting a friend who had just started graduate school here, like a number of you, and I was very much struck by the beautiful campus and the environs, but you couldn't see much beyond campus, because this was the summer, and it was uh, just choked in brown smog. And in fact, I came back a few years later in the winter, and all of a sudden, there were these beautiful mountains there. I didn't understand how they had quite gotten there so quickly. Um, and of course, today, you can look out and see the San Gabriels, just three miles from campus, and you can see them summer and winter. And the reason you can see them, and the reason you're not choking on smog, is a Caltech story. So it was, in fact, the fundamental understanding of atmospheric chemistry by Professor Ari Hagen Smith, who is a flavor chemist, that led to this uh, discovery and the change in policy in California and across the nation to get rid of smog. So Hagen Schmidt was interested in uh, flavors like red wine and pineapple, studying the chemical constituents, and he got interested in what he called the taste of Los Angeles. So not a very propitious taste in terms of taking it out of the air. But he discovered in experiments that it was the emissions from automobiles, nitrous oxides interacting with hydrocarbons in the presence of sunlight, that led to this smog. And in fact, he went on to become the first head of the California Air Resources Board, which led to the changes in policy that uh, got rid, put uh, controls, catalytic converters on automobiles and cleaned up the air. So Caltech, of course, you've come here in a lot of ways because of our commitment to fundamental discovery, and we have a deep commitment to fundamental discovery. But we also care enormously um, about impact on society. And it's this connection between the fundamental research and the connections to society where you can make enormous contributions. So another good example, a related one in terms of the environment, which was not quite as intentional as Hagen Schmidt and more serendipity, but you have to seize the moment, uh, was Claire Patterson in uh, geolo geology and planetary sciences. So Claire was trying to date the age of the Earth using lead isotopes. And he needed an environment in his laboratory where there was no contamination, background contamination from lead. And what he found, well, he determined the age of the Earth, and actually the age of the Earth, 4.5 plus or minus 0.1 billion years, is still the accepted number. The error bars are a little smaller now. Uh, but, but he really came up in the 60s, with the, or late 50s, with, the, uh, with a remarkable uh, insights and, and uh, resolution. Uh, but what he found, was that no matter how hard he tried to clean everything up, there was always background contamination. And he looked into where was all this lead coming from. And of course, it was coming from the fact that automobiles were burning leaded gasoline. And this lead was in the air, and it was everywhere. And he went on also to push for removing the lead from the air, which can be quite injurious, as you know, uh, and the whole start of unleaded gasoline. So here is another good example of how just trying to do basic science, trying to understand how things work, can lead then to applications that change people's lives. You come at a remarkable time for doing science and technology. There are revolutions all over the place. Of course, in sustainability, and you'll hear talks today, uh, telling you a bit about our efforts there and the Resnick Sustainability Institute, which lets us approach problems at real scale. Uh, 
But there are revolutions in astronomy right now, trying to ask where we've come from and are we alone in the universe? And with exoplanets and our missions to Mars through JPL and to the outer planets, moons of Jupiter and Saturn, we will know more about this in the next decades to come. Quantum mechanics is at a point now where we're looking at entangled states, not just discrete energy levels, and there's a second revolution, which will have both fundamental understanding and technolog technological applications. We have a new center on neuroscience, which brings together elements from across the campus to ask fundamental questions about the brain. We're making revolutions in single cell biology, being able not only to look at co collections of cells, but to understand their expression of proteins and messenger RNA throughout uh, with spatial resolution. And it goes on and on. And even though things are crazy when you read the news, uh, science and technology pushes on, and if you're a place in uh, the scientific and engineering universe where you can make special contributions. Caltech is also a place which emphasizes community, emphasizes people. We value you as individuals. We want to see you succeed. You will succeed. And we want desperately for you to learn from your peers as well as from the faculty. So please take advantage of that opportunity to get to know each other, to take advantage of the insights that your colleagues will bring to you as you start this exciting adventure. So I want to end uh, with a quote from uh, Dennis Gabor, who's the Nobel laureate for inventing uh, holography. And he said that futures can't be predicted, but they can be made. And so that is, in fact, what you can do. You can create a wonderful future, and we will all here look forward to following you as you do this, to understanding your insights, and to applauding your accomplishments. So welcome. So, so my, my, my final part on this stage here uh, is to introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Kevin Gilmartin. Uh, Kevin is a professor of English literature, uh, specializing in the uh, 18th century and early 19th century. Uh, he uh, is an award-winning teacher, having won two prizes from the students, ASCIT, uh, here, as well as the Institute's highest teaching award, the Feynman Prize for Excellence in Teaching. Uh, and he is also committed fully to your success. And he has spent a great deal of time, both as Dean of Undergraduate Studies and now, now Vice President for Student Affairs, thinking about how to improve both the curricular and co-curricular experience for students. And I'll just say finally uh, that uh, the reason we're here safe together through this pandemic owes a large part to Kevin's thoughtful interventions as we've tried to navigate the path of keeping everyone safe in the community, uh, but also permitting enough interaction so that social isolation doesn't overwhelm us all. And so I look forward to a normal year, whatever that means these days. Uh, and, uh, but you can rest assured uh, uh, that Kevin's dedication and uh, uh, insights will make sure that we do this safely. So Kevin. Welcome, and uh, thank you, Tom, uh, for those uh, thoughtful reflections, uh, some history lessons, which as a humanities professor, I always appreciate, uh, and, and those kind words. And for those of you who don't know, um, the last couple of years, this was an event that we did remotely. So we all came here in turn and recorded our, our parts. Uh, so it's just really terrific uh, uh, to be able to return to doing it in person. 
So as you've heard, uh, I am a professor in the uh, uh, Division of Humanities and Social Sciences at Caltech. And as Vice President for Student Affairs, I have the privilege now of working closely with our remarkable student leaders uh, and a really committed uh, and talented support staff. And one of the opportunities that I will invite you to embrace while you're here is, is to participate in student leadership. It's really been incredibly rewarding to me. As a professor, you don't see that. And, and you know, as, as a member of the administration, I appreciate much more how much student leaders uh, contribute to keeping Caltech going. So in marking uh, the beginning of the academic year, Convocation allows us uh, to welcome you as new students to our rich uh, learning and research community um, with your families and friends uh, and to celebrate the beginning of your Caltech journey. And while each of you will certainly find your own way through during your time here, you'll also share in what uh, Tom described, uh, the distinctive intimacy, creativity, and collaborative spirit of Caltech. You are joining a community, and this event is a celebration of that. You'll have the chance to learn today from faculty and other students about some of what makes Caltech special. And you'll continue in the coming days and weeks, particularly through orientation programs, to be introduced to other dimensions of the Caltech experience. And again, I really encourage you to embrace those. Um, we have social and recreational activities, music, theater, athletics, community service is becoming more and more important to students, and it's nice to see that. Um, and uh, many of our clubs and st other student activities. So while you are all drawn here by our core commitment to science and technology, as a professor of literature, I can attest to the remarkable breadth and diversity of the Caltech experience. And again, I encourage you to embrace it. With that said, it is fitting that today's convocation gathering allows us to focus on research because one of the remarkable things about Caltech is that all of you who are joining us here today, undergraduate students as well as graduate students and postdocs, will have the opportunity to contribute meaningfully to our critical research mission. It's also fitting that our theme is sustainability and sustainability education. My own research has focused in part on the impact of the Industrial Revolution on British society and culture. And with that sense of historical perspective, I'm often struck by the pivotal time in which we now live and work. As the long-term impact of human society on global systems requires that we move with a real sense of urgency toward more sustainable technologies and ways of living. Caltech has singularly committed itself to that effort, and I'm inspired by the leadership our faculty has shown in this respect. So it's my privilege now to introduce two of my faculty colleagues who've generously agreed to join us and share with you some of their own work. Our first speaker is Tio Agapi, professor and currently executive officer for chemistry in our division of chemistry and chemical engineering. He received his bachelor of science degree from MIT in 2001 and his PhD from Caltech in 2007, working here under Professor Bar Burkhoff, where his uh, thesis received uh, the Herbert Newby McCoy Award for an outstanding contribution to chemistry. He returned to us as professor in 2009 and uh, reports having developed his uh, initial passion for chemistry during high school, something many of you no doubt appreciate. And he par participated in international chemistry, chemistry competitions as part of the student team from his native Romania. His lab works to develop new materials and catalysts for sustainable technologies in the context of environmental impacts and limited energy resources in part by taking inspiration from biological systems. In that sense, he represents a key dimension of the collaborative spirit at Caltech, our commitment to interdisciplinary research. His group's work is centered on the synthesis and study of metal complexes that are relevant to, to catalysis. He's also a committed educator, active in high school outreach, and professor um, through the years for both introductory and intermediate chemistry courses at Caltech. We are very much a teaching faculty here. Our second faculty speaker is uh, 
Professor Jess Adkins, who's Smith, Smith's family professor of geochemistry and global environmental science in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from Haverford College in 1990 as a liberal arts uh, college uh, protege, I, I want to point that out, uh, followed by his PhD from MIT in 1998, and he joined the Caltech faculty in 2000. He's a chemical oceanographer interested in trace metals as tracers of environmental processes. His current work is partly centered around the geochemical investigation of past climates, with a primary concern for the last few glacial interglacial cycles. As an oceanographer, he aims to understand the coupled ocean and atmospheric system during these shifts by monitoring the deep ocean's behavior. Much of his work to date has focused on deep sea corals as, new, as a new climate archive that can provide rich information about oceanographic climate change. He's also taught across our, our undergraduate curriculum, and as he will uh, uh, let us know, he's uh, joined today by one of his graduate students. And finally, I want to point out uh, that uh, Avery House residents and recent alums will also know that until 2020, he was, with his wonderful family, part of our faculty in residence program in Avery, and I thank him for that. All right, so now after a brief video montage, um, Theo will join us to talk about sustainability and sustainability education, and Jess will follow. Uh, to speak about CO2 sequestration. Please join me in welcoming them, in thanking them for giving us their time, and in starting our 2022 convocation program. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, uh, Theo Agapie, uh, professor uh, in chemistry. Uh, and I'd like to start by uh, thanking uh, Tom and, and Kevin for uh, uh, the thoughtful words for the introduction and really for the opportunity to be here to uh, welcome you. So, uh, welcome to Caltech. Um, about uh, two decades uh, ago now, uh, I was where you, where you are, uh, feeling a little bit of trepidation, uh, but a lot of excitement too, and uh, I still vividly remember that, uh, that first week of the orientation uh, where Really, I made a lot of friends, a lot of friends that uh, I, I still keep in touch with, and uh, uh, the, 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 the next few years are really dear uh, memories. Of course, I, I, I love this place. I'm still here. Um, and, and part of the reason for, for being here is really being able to uh, work with um, new generations of students year, year after year and, uh, and uh, learn from you. Um, and, um, the other part is really the, the collegiality of, of this place. I mean, it's, it's incredible uh, how easy it is to um, run, run into someone, you know, down you know, the red door or down the corridor and start talking about a scientific or technological problem and try to come up with, with a solution uh, where, you know, mixing expertise where, where uh, perhaps we, we wouldn't have thought about uh, doing that uh, before. And so, so today I'd like to uh, give you uh, two vignettes uh, that my group uh, is involved with related to sustainability, where um, working uh, with teams of people with different expertise has been instrumental in advancing the, the science. And so th these are problems related to the electrocatalytic uh, CO2 conversion, in particular uh, to fuels. And I'm going to touch upon uh, the, 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 the opportunities created by the Resnick Institute as well as uh, a, a DOE uh, program. And so we'd like, as a chemist, I think a lot about sustainability in, in chemistry. Um, and so we'd like to, to, to be able to work in a, in a sustainable chemical landscape. And really, I, I'm, I'm not going to try to provide a, a reason for doing that. I, you can pick uh, uh, today's newspaper and, and see uh, 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 issues related to climate change and so forth. And so really, in general, we'd like to be able to, to do everything more sustainably. In terms of chemistry, obviously, this slide is really quite complicated. Um, this is only a subset of the problems chemists like to think about. Uh, but to break it down, we'd like to, to be able to use renewable energy, and um, that may include solar, wind, hydro. Um, have to take this energy and store it somehow, um, and you can do that using batteries or converting that energy into chemical bonds. Um, 
like uh, fuels that uh, contain uh, carbon-carbon bonds, for example. They're, those are high energy fuels, like the ones we use uh, in, in combustion cars. And they like to be able to use common precursors, uh, including uh, carbon dioxide. Maybe we can take it from, from air or from, from a power plant, like to be able to convert these uh, chemicals uh, into modern technology. And of course, I'm, I'm biased here, but I think at the center of all that is, is chemistry, is, is uh, uh, the science that allows us to, to uh, take precursors, energy, and um, uh, make them into whatever we want to make, new chemicals, new materials, uh, and, and uh, new technologies. And so in order to be able to do that, uh, really clearly, these are, these are very complex challenges. And, and they, they require collaboration between research teams with diverse uh, expertise. It's, it's really uh, uh, absolutely required to, to be able to, to make uh, a, a significant impact given the complexity of the problems. And so my first uh, vignette is, is related to conversion of carbon dioxide uh, to uh, carbon-based fuels uh, for energy storage. And let me give you an example of uh, a compound that perhaps we could derive from carbon dioxide, that's ethylene. Okay, no nowadays we make ethylene from crude oil. It require, requires processing in a refinery, steam cracking. Um, we, we make ethylene on, on huge scales, over 200 million tons uh, per year. And that process requires uh, uh, or involves a lot of carbon dioxide emissions, uh, over 500 million tons per year, a significant percentage of the CO2 uh, emissions. So you could imagine a, a, another way to make carbon dioxide, um, uh, make ethylene, using carbon dioxide, right? Uh, uh, the greenhouse gas that uh, is, is a problem in, in terms of um, um, affecting uh, affecting climate change. And so you could imagine using renewable energy, carbon dioxide, some sort of catalyst and, and water, and make the same product that we currently make uh, from uh, petroleum. So I'm not gonna go to, through the, the details of, of the science, um, but just wanna give you a flavor of, of the types of uh, systems we, we develop. Um, this really involve um, complex catalytic materials. And so I'm showing here uh, a, a copper uh, base uh, a foil. It turns out that under certain conditions, this foil starts to nucleate these uh, nanostructures that, that look like cubes. You can see them on the top right side uh, in the AFM image, uh, the, 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 the facets of the, those uh, uh, nanostructures. And then in the presence of an organic additive that we, we make as chemists in the lab, uh, a film is generated, an organic film is generated on top of this metallic electrode. And so the combination of this metal and the organic film allows for carbon dioxide to be converted with high selectivity uh, to, to ethylene. And of course, this uh, entire process and uh, developing it uh, involves uh, uh, or requires expertise in, in various uh, areas of science, including surface characterization, chemical synthesis, electro electrochemistry, and product characterization. And so this is a lead, an entry into uh, how one might make uh, more advanced materials for catalysis to, to convert CO2 to ethylene. A next step there was to uh, 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 further improve the process by making a variety of, uh, by synthesizing a variety of uh, organic molecules that can uh, be part of, of this film shown, shown uh, on the right in, in light blue that's gonna coat the copper electrode shown in, in red. Um, and so it turns out that upon uh, uh, iterations of this process, um, uh, we could uh, obtain ethylene with really high selectivities, 70%, uh, improved stability and, and high CO2 utilization efficiency. Um, now, of course, these are not yet uh, 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 applicable to, to the industry, but uh, studying them provide the fundamental science that we think will, will help lead the way towards uh, 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 practical applications. 
Now clearly this slide was meant to, to show you that we can look at a lot of organic molecules. Um, wh when do we stop or ho how do we explore the, 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 the really incredible diverse space of, of um, options we have in terms of uh, improving the materials? And here I'd like to um, uh, highlight uh, the high throughput experimentation team uh, from Caltech uh, in, a, in a short clip. So I emphasize the organic aspect, the, the, the synthetic aspect. If you think more broadly at the periodic table, there are many elements that one could use to make uh, these uh, electrodes uh, that I talked about for catalysis. And the high throughput experimentation at, uh, group at Caltech can, can mix using uh, robotic tools, mix materials um, in a very reproducible and systematic way uh, that allows for, for studies of uh, uh, conversion to solar fuels. Now, th those data, th th those experiments result in a tremendous uh, amount of data that then, then go beyond the, 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 the uh, syn syn synthesis part, the uh, materials characterization part. It becomes data analysis where you have to integrate uh, expertise really from across the campus to be able to really understand uh, what's happening in, in these processes. And so I'm not going to again go through the details, but we generate a lot of data from, from these experiments. Um, and I'm highlighting um, on, the, on the bottom right in the plot there two of the points that uh, really show good performance for electrocatalysis. Um, these experiments uh, require chemical synthesis, catalytic screening, and data analysis. And it really was a collaborative effort uh, from a, a team in applied physics and material science and chemistry that allowed us to uh, advance uh, technology. These experiments that are shown here require uh, 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 perhaps more than a year of a person time to do if we use the, the tools the, uh, in the high throughput experimentation team, they, they might take a week, okay? Um, and so this, uh, this interdisciplinary f effort highlighted at Caltech is actually part of a much bigger effort involving multiple universities and national labs that is sponsored by uh, the Department of Energy. Again, highlighting that for problems of the complexity of this one, where we'd like to, to be able to convert carbon dioxide to fuels, you need uh, uh, teams that really bring together uh, a very uh, diverse set of expertise. Now, we have uh, the, the same uh, uh, strategy at Caltech here uh, through uh, the Resnick Sustainability uh, Institute, or, or RSI. And, and my second vignette here, I like to focus on energy storage uh, through batteries. This is uh, a project that uh, started very recently, a year ago, uh, that was sponsored through uh, the Resnick uh, Institute. Just in terms of context, actually, as my colleague Kim C mentioned in the clip before my presentation, magnesium is an alternative to lithium batteries. We'd like to be able to move beyond lithium because of uh, the lithium distribution uh, on the planet. Okay, it's re really limited to a certain location. And uh, it turns out magnesium. It is more abundant, therefore more sustainable, but it also gives good theoretical capacity for, for the batteries. You know, if we, do, if we get what we want, we'll actually make uh, better batteries, not only uh, more sustainable batteries. Um, and as, as my colleague Julia Greer uh, mentioned in the, in the first uh, clip you, you saw, a big challenge in, in the field is to make electrolytes that are uh, more robust and allow for batteries that last longer. And, and the electrolyte is in this center part of this building, uh, of this, of this uh, uh, figure. Uh, the orange spheres are metal atoms. They're supposed to go back and forth between top and bottom. And what's in the center there is the electrolyte and, and the ability of that material to withstand Many, many ch uh, discharges and recharges is what's going to define the, the, the performance of the battery. 
And so as, as chemists, we've been able to uh, use chemical synthesis to, to, to make a, a, a broad range of potential structures for, for these electrolytes. Um, and it turns out that uh, a couple of uh, the structures explored really have very interesting performance in terms of robustness and in particular, the window for uh, uh, electrolyte stability, uh, very high in terms of potential. And again, to be able to, to access this, this type of material and, and test them in the context of batteries required interdisciplinary research. Chemical synthesis, electrochemistry, mater material science. And that really would not have been possible without uh, bringing together two teams that uh, can connect uh, these uh, uh, different and, and uh, um, you know, perhaps orthogonal uh, uh, um, expertise. And that was possible because the Resnick Institute Providing, uh, provided funded funding for risky ideas. Um, that's one, one aspect. The other aspect is really, this was in part driven by the students being interested in working between our groups, okay? So it's, it's you coming in, a graduate student as a first year was interested after a rotation in Kim's group and a rotation in my group in starting a project that's between our two groups. And that got us thinking about um, how, um, how we can approach a problem uh, using our expertise. But I'd like to now spend a couple of minutes to, to uh, talk about this incredible uh, resource uh, that is uh, Resnick Institute on, on campus. Um, and uh, in, in particular, to the generosity of the Resnick family, uh, coming online in two years now is the uh, new Resnick Sustainability Center. Um, it's gonna be just a, a one minute walk uh, that way, a beautiful building uh, uh, with facilities to support research in, in sustainability. Um, and not only that, but also uh, in education, okay? There will be undergraduate laboratories and uh, active learning spaces. As I mentioned, it will open in a, in a couple of years, so it's not here yet. Um, but the research and educational opportunities are available now. Um, and my, my colleague, uh, Jess Atkins, who's going to give the next talk, and I had the, the, the chance to uh, be part of uh, uh, this educational committee on sustainability. And uh, we know that there is incredible interest uh, and enga engagement on campus from, from faculty and students uh, related to sustainability. How to incorporate them uh, ideas in, in education, how to be part of it, how to promote uh, new ideas, and so, some of it you see it already. Um, this, this building will, will house um, facilities um, in, in, a, in a really broad range of areas related to sustainability. Solar science and, and catalysis, which was the focus of uh, my, the first part of, of my talk. Um, computing, ecology, uh, water, environment, uh, all of these are gonna be uh, facilities in, 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 in the building. Um, but what I think is really truly exciting uh, is the possibility of students and you know, all of our undergrads walking through this building and there, there are many uh, interaction spaces. Every single undergraduate at Caltech will actually have to, be, to walk through this building and take classes here because the, the, the chemistry labs that where uh, CAM uh, 3A and CAM 3X uh, will, will be located, will be on the second floor of this building, okay? Um, which of course is exciting in, in terms of having, having state-of-the-art facilities, but I think is, is incredibly exciting because the students coming through will be able to interact with, uh, with the researchers uh, doing their sustainability science in, in these uh, 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 research uh, facilities. Okay, and so we, with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, my group, present and uh, uh, past. These are some pictures from uh, our camping trips uh, in the uh, Sierra Mountains. Um, uh, we, we, we have a, a lot of fun in lab and outside, and this, this is uh, seeing these pictures. Um, I'd like to also remind you that you know, you, you'll, you'll be here and you'll be excited about doing science. Um, Take some time to go outside and explore Southern California and explore uh, Los Angeles. Okay, and uh, with that, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, give it away to uh, my colleague, Jess Atkins.
Thank you, Teo. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Tom. Um, uh, I guess it's one example of the collegiality is that uh, I know them all by their first name, not Herr Dr. Professor Teo Agape. Um, uh, I'd like to take you guys a little bit, continuing to Teo, where Teo left us with the physical spaces of the Resnick Institute, take you a little bit now with what you might be able to do tomorrow instead, instead of waiting around till 2024 when this building is there, and then give you an example or a flavor of some of the uh, themes that, um, that Tom touched on and how it is that basic research uh, might lead to applied research, taking some of the things that have been Caltech's core and getting after sustainable problems. Okay, so um, that means you need to know how to do some stuff. And Teo and I looked into this as part of being uh, on this education committee together and to think about how to bring sustainable education into the Caltech experience. And the National Academy of Sciences had also looked at this problem at about the same time, and they came up with this table on the left of core competencies, right? Already it's getting to be like, what? That, that's things you need to know, right? What, what, what do you need to be good at in order to, uh, uh, to do sustainability? And they came up with this big list that we spent some time trying to unpack, and so I thought I'd try to turn it into a little bit more of a plain language, like, go figure out how to do these things tomorrow. So, systems thinking really just comes down to uh, don't stovepipe. You have to actually be more than just being a chemist or more than just being a geologist or more being, uh, being a physicist. Physicists, sustainability problems are at the intersections of all of our basic uh, uh, problems. And if you decide just to, to stovepipe, it's gonna be harder for you to solve the really challenging problems that are in front of us. Anticipatory, uh, that just means, look, it's coming at us. Like, you have to focus on what is coming at us. And I actually like to add into this, you need to be comfortable with uncertainty. <laughs> uh, as somebody who works on past climates and paleoclimates and trying to understand what had gone on uh, uh, thousands to, to millions of years ago, this is something I've grown up with. But in order to solve sustainability problems, we're gonna have to enter in to looking at solutions without fully understanding what we're up against. This normative category is really about the ethics of what we're doing. Like this, these problems are at their core human problems, and it's the technology that comes second. We often flip that around here at Caltech uh, because it's uh, often where our skill set lies, but it's really important to remember that sustainability problems are human problems. Um, strategic, look, this is about doing things at scale. They, these problems are planetary in scale, and we want, from the beginning, you want to be thinking about that. You're gonna have some problem that feels sort of bite-sized and something that you're gonna be able to take off. I'll give you an example of how that's been working in our lab. But ultimately, you wanna have your goals at, the, at solving problems at scale. We're here at Caltech to solve the hardest problems. And then collaboration, of course, is the way you do any of that. <laughs> You have to be thinking and working with your colleagues around you, mostly your student colleagues. The faculty will get in the way, right? It's really a good chance for you to, uh, uh, to solve these problems together. Okay, so um, that's what the National Academy says you need to be good at. What is Caltech good at? Caltech is really good at basic science, right? That has been our core mission all along. It's not necessarily the same thing as being good at sustainability science, right? That you, you wanna go after really fundamental basic science questions. And Tom really introduced us to Claire Patterson. Here he is in the lab. This is, a, he's one of our environmental heroes because he started thinking about using lead, lead dating to get the age of the earth by getting, finding a bunch of different materials that you see over on the right, meteorites, ocean sediments. The slope of that line leads to uh, uh, calculating the age of the earth. And you see it's done as a slope of lead isotope ratios. Tom referred to that we needed to find low blanks. Uh, Claire was obsessive about this. This is Claire in the lab uh, without his shirt on, not just to show off his ripped physique, but uh, he is cleaning up to make sure that there's no lead around, and most of the lead comes from him at this time in the 50s. He's taking off his clothes because of the volatile lead that's in the atmosphere from burning uh, leaded gasoline. And so you didn't have to work naked in Claire's lab, though there are colleagues of mine who said he probably would have preferred that. Um, uh, and he got quite obsessive about thinking about why is there so much lead in the environment and realized that we were poisoning ourselves, 
with, uh, with the amount of lead in the environment, and that there didn't used to be as much lead in the environment as by going and looking at Roman bones, Etruscan bones, deep ocean uh, concentrations of lead where there's old waters. And it really became a focus of his activist life to think about how we could get lead out of our industrial um, uh, complex that chiefly was stopping the burning of leaded gasoline. And I think this is a beautiful example of Claire Patterson's legacy. So the, this is a le record on the y-axis here of the lead concentration, or the lead calcium ratio, in coral skeletons, which are made out of calcium carbonate, from Bermuda, right, from the, from, uh, the open ocean Atlantic. And corals, I, maybe you know this already, like trees, uh, precipitate rings, the annual rings that you can go and count back. And so this record starts back around 1850 at the Industrial Revolution. And we can see the onset of industrial revolution, the industri industrialization leading to higher and higher lead concentrations. There's a tick up at the sign of the world wars. The American era really kicks in in the 50s and we get that sharp rise. And then in the early 70s, through Claire's activism, we passed the Clean Air Act. Good environmental laws will solve environmental problems. And they'll do it, they'll be good laws if they're based on solid technology and solid understanding of how it works. I think this is really one of the most beautiful examples of how we have a shot. <laughs> We've actually done this before. We figured out how not to kill ourselves off with lead and we can see the corals immediately responded. This record now drops down and down and down and come back to a background. It's not zero because we're still um, producing lead ores uh, around the world. But really kind of an amazing record of the environmental legacy from Patterson. Okay, so what's the one in front of us? What's, what's the next lead? I, there are a variety of, of, of sustainability problems or environmental problems we have to go at. I would argue that climate change is probably the biggest and one of the ones we really need to solve the fastest. This comes from my bailiwick of looking at past climates. This is about a million years of climate history from the Antarctic ice cores. There are two records here. The one in red is the temperature record derived from the isotopes of hydrogen in the ice. Um, and the upper one is the CO2 concentration trapped in the bubbles in the ice. And I think that this has been up long enough for you to see that they go together. In fact, we don't get the, the, the red line of the glacial and the glacial transitions, and the jump from cold to warm cannot happen without that change in CO2 in the atmosphere. CO2 is a very important part of our glacial and glacial history. We can see just from the shapes here. Here's what we've done since 1850. It's impossible for me to make this line thin enough so that you can see it on this, uh, on this time axis, but it is the right height. The tip of that arrow sits at about 405 uh, ppm, roughly where we're sitting uh, the atmosphere right now. We are conducting an experiment of unprecedented magnitude and rate ever in our climate system, and we don't know how it's going to turn out. That's that uncertainty problem. It's become very clear that we're not going to get around this problem just by converting away from emissions of CO2 from, from fossil fuels, but we're going to have to take CO2 out of the atmosphere if we want to avoid the worst consequences of the warming. Okay, there's another CO2 problem. It's a, you know, it gets worse, sorry, <laughs> but the CO2 is an acid and it's acidifying the ocean and making it harder for some of my favorite organisms, the corals, to actually grow. And so as that CO2 is invading the ocean, it's getting harder and harder for corals to precipitate their calcium carbonate uh, skeletons. And th that seemed like a really straightforward chemical oceanography problem, but the literature is a disaster about what will actually happen to the corals. This, this is a plot of various um, fits to rate laws in the literature of the dissolution rate on the y-axis and then an x-axis that we invent using this thing omega so you don't know what we're talking about so we can keep our jobs. Scientists do this all the time, right? Uh, get, come up with some way to really confuse folks. One minus omega is a degree of undersaturation for the mineral uh, that, the, that the corals are precipitating. So 5%, 10%, 15% undersaturated equilibrium is here on the left. So that's the driving force to dissolve. And I think you can see that these curve fits are all over the place. There's orders and orders of magnitude different pathways that, the same, that, that should be exactly one line. There's only one answer to how fast the calcium carbonate would dissolve in the ocean given how undersaturated it is. What is the driving force really going after those corals? It was kind of embarrassing, actually, as low temperature geochemists and oceanographers that the state of the literature about eight years ago uh, looked this way. And so me and my colleague, Will Burleson at USC, we came up with a trick. 
We said, we can go after this problem. We can understand the fundamentals of how the dissolution rate works for calcium carbonate in the ocean. What is that pressure that's on the corals? By using isotopes. It's a great uh, tried and true Caltech trick. And we are going to have a bag of water. That's the big blue that you see here. The calcium carbonate is uh, the block that you see on the left. But instead of it having its regular isotope ratio of, of carbon-13 and carbon-12, we're going to use purely labeled C13 solids. That's what the Caltech trick. We bought some. We've made some in the lab. And so we can monitor as the big blocks shrink to smaller blocks. That's dissolving solid. We can monitor the C13, C12 ratio in the solution. And that we can do by mass spectrometry and do very, very precisely. And so that gave us about a 200 times more sensitive way to look at those rate laws to start to go investigate this in the lab. It's really been a super fun uh, uh, trip back into my chemical roots. Here is a bunch of data now, summarized. so fast forward about six years of uh, two different PhD students in, in the group. This is now a log-log plot of the same thing that you saw before. So there's something like six orders of magnitude of rate there on the y-axis. And uh, that minus one is 10% undersaturated, minus two is 1% undersaturated. And we can see now that in the lab, we have the squares that are sitting on top. And we figured out how to go do it out in the ocean as well. And those are the circles that you see down below. We're really beginning to understand why there were all those different curves that you could put on. It's because there are different modes of dissolution that lead to sharp kinks in the transitions between, it, uh, between how the calcium carbonate dissolves. Really a super fun interaction of the oceanography and the physical chemistry of what is the rule at work, the basic science at work. Well, this is the reaction that the planet runs to solve global warming and has been doing for billions of years. We know what's gonna happen to the fossil fuel-based uh, CO2 that we've put into the atmosphere as oceanographers and geochemists. It is gonna be titrated against the base, the acid in the CO2 is gonna be titrated against the base in the calcium carbonate sediments at the bottom of the ocean. And it's gonna take a few tens of thousands of years for this pulse of CO2 that we've put up to then drop back down. Very short on Earth history sorts of timescales, but kind of useless if we're gonna survive <laughs> and, not, and not cook ourselves. Uh, uh, in, a, in a real way. But now we understand the basics of the rate and how this works. One of the chief understanding, a, a, a flaws in our ability to say exactly how long it's going to take is understanding this rate law. And so how do we make it go faster? Build a chemical reactor instead. Here's the kind of thing that we've begun to work on, that we've begun to switch away from the basic science to the engineering. Place the seawater, the calcium carbonate, uh, uh, in a reactor and bubble in CO2-rich flue gas from, say, a combustion source of, uh, so that we have uh, CO2-rich gases coming in the bottom. They react with the calcium carbonate to give us CO2-lean gases coming out of the top. This becomes an engineering problem. Can you carry it off at scale? So we've been thinking about where is the best place to try to carry that off at scale, and we're really excited about doing this on ships. Ships have really three things that bring the accelerated weathering of limestone, or AWL, one of our options for carbon dioxide removal. They're a point source of CO2 because they are um, putting out about 3 to 5% in, uh, in their flue gas. They're some of the largest objects that we build as humans, and so they can carry vast quantities of limestone around with them, one of the reactants. And the chief knock against AWL as a, as a carbon dioxide removal technique is pumping water uphill, while well, a ship going at 10 to 20 knots is a massive water pump in and of itself, and so it gets you that part for free. That's been an exciting uh, way forward for us. The other part is that there are a lot of ships. <laughs> the shipping industry puts out about 3% of total emissions on the planet. If we could decarbonize the shipping industry, we would have taken a big bite out of this uh, CO2 problem. Um, and we think there are ways that we could actually do more than just the shipping industry by uh, uh, having different sources of carbon aboard. And so that got us to building things in the lab. Here's a version of one of those chemical reactors downstairs in the Lynn building in my lab. And we are currently building in Houston a prototype that lands here uh, in, uh, in December, where uh, it's now at the right scale. So you can see uh, a human over there on the left. This is about a nine foot tall reactor hooked up to a real diesel generator over there on the right. I'm going to actually spin out uh, here from Caltech and go on leave starting in January to take this company forward to try to see if we can't pull this off at scale. I had no idea that was what was in front of me six, seven, eight years ago when we got started on putting isotope labels in the, uh, uh, in the water, but it is the kind of thing that you guys can go do. 
all right, if you're good at the National Academy's list. So how did we do, right? Don't stovepipe. Well, this was a problem that you needed oceanographers, chemical engineers, we have to understand the fluid dynamics, it just kind of goes on and on. Sustainability problems really are uh, cross-border. Focus on what's coming, we're trying to go after the CO2 that we're gonna keep putting in the atmosphere. Um, it's uh, obviously, this, we need to make sure this is an ethical solution, it's a solution that does no harm by mimicking the Earth's natural reaction, we're starting off from a good spot. We know that the uh, Earth has been running this uh, for billions of years. Of course, scale is what we're about, right? We're trying to go after big chunks of the problem. We're not sort of pausing along the way to see, hey, maybe we could make a little bit uh, of money. The only reason, somebody's gonna have to make a gazillion dollars off of, uh, off of CO2 sequestration. The only reason we're in it is to do it at scale. And then collaboration, of course, is at the heart of it. And just to give you a couple of examples here, that's my friend Will Burleson over the right, a professor at USC. Pierre Foran is a mechanical engineer who joined our group from the Total. And Melissa Gutierrez uh, graduated from Caltech a couple of years ago as an undergraduate. And we have been lucky enough to attract her back to come uh, and work with us as we go on this journey. So that's what we're up to. I think that you guys can do the same thing. Focus on a basic science problem, but already have in mind scale, scale, scale. How am I gonna be able to take this to a problem that really matters? That's at the heart of doing sustainability well. I'm gonna hand this over to Holly Barnhart, a graduate student in my lab and an inspiration to me. Holly comes to us uh, from having done her undergraduate at, at UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, I think, as you'll see, uh, Holly is a real joy to have around. So thanks for listening to us. All right, hi everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction, Jess. My name is Holly Barnhart. I'm a fourth year grad student in geochemistry in the Department of Geological and Planetary Sciences. And I wanted to take this time to talk just a little bit about my experience as a graduate student here through this lens of sustainability research and also just talk a little bit about the cool opportunities that have been afforded to me as a grad student here at Caltech. Um, so a little bit of background about me. I did my undergrad at UC Berkeley. I majored in earth science, which sounds super broad, and I did have a really like, broad range of interests in undergrad. What that meant was that I wasn't super sure what I wanted to do when I got to grad school. Um, the main thing I knew was that I wanted whatever basic science questions I was working on to have some sort of broader impact on communities or the environment. Um, so I had a couple conversations with this crazy professor at Caltech that told me he was gonna solve climate change um, and that I could help him do that by understanding or by using um, the, the lab skills that, that I had developed in undergrad, um, apply those to the geochemical sort of questions that I was interested in um, to help him develop these accelerated weathering of limestone reactors. Um, he was pretty convincing. I ended up here. Uh, so my first year at Caltech looked a little something like this. It turns out the only photos I have in the lab are from Halloween. Uh, so this is what a typical day in the lab looks like with a little bit less cowboy action going on. Um, this is me and a grad student at USC that we collaborate with, developing some, some devices that we take out to sea with us. And then this is uh, what another day in the lab looks like, shaking bags of seawater. This is doing those dissolution experiments that Jess talked about earlier. My second year at Caltech looked a little bit more like this, a view I'm sure you are all very familiar with and absolutely sick of. Um, but between working in the lab, moving a little bit towards more remote work, this whole time our group was interested in better understanding seawater chemistry, and in particular, the ocean carbon cycle. So to dig a little bit deeper into the science of the work that, that I'm interested in and that our group works on, um, I've got this super simplified schematic of some of the ocean carbon cycle. Our group is interested in um, one of the solid forms of calcium carbonate in the ocean. Um, that's what critters in the surface ocean make their shells out of. There are some images of what those shells look like in the corner there. It's what corals make their shells out of. Our group's interested in the stability of this mineral and how it influences the ocean carbon cycle. In recent years, our group has been most focused on the stability of this mineral at the seafloor. And that meant that we got the chance to go to sea and take some samples. Uh, this is a little video of us preparing for the deployment of a multi-core. 
multi-core is this big sort of metal frame that you see there. It's got a bunch of devices attached underneath it that allow us to collect samples from the seafloor, both sediment and water samples, and also do experiments at the seafloor. So those sort of dissolution experiments you saw in the lab, we actually ended up doing out at sea. This is a view of the underside of that multi-core, so those Plastic clear tubes allow us to collect sediment from the seafloor, and they are some of the other devices on there are what allow us to collect water and perform those experiments. And so this is a really exciting video for us of this device being deployed, making contact with the seafloor, penetrating the sediment water interface. It'll, it disturbs some of the little starfish down there just a little bit. Um, it allows us to collect solid samples and also do those experiments down there and collect water for us to, to make measurements on back up on board. So some of the data that we collect from a cruise like this would look something like this without getting into too much detail about the, what, what this data is actually telling us. Um, it's giving us information about the stability of these minerals based on the experiments that we did at sea and in the lab. And one of the key takeaways here is that the structure of the data between our lab experiments and our experiments at sea, the structure is very, very similar. And what that's telling us is that the chemical reactions and atomic processes that are controlling the stability of these calcium carbonate minerals that we're able to parameterize in the lab, we can extrapolate that to other ocean environments, in particular the seafloor. And this all sounds pretty basic science-y. Um, as I was promised when I got here, I, was, I should have some connection back to uh, broader impacts. And it turns out that the way that we understand the stability of these calcium carbonate minerals under different ocean conditions can actually inform how we use these minerals in these AWL reactors that Jess talked about. So that's a little bit just of the basics of my research experience here at Caltech. I wanted to touch on just some of the other cool opportunities I've had as a grad student here. Um, the first being field work. You guys have seen these pictures now. Um, it's a really wonderful opportunity to go to sea. Our group also collaborates with um, other groups on campus and at other institutions. Being in LA is a really cool place to do research because there's a lot of other large research institutions around. And so we collaborate closely with the group from USC. And then for the undergrads in the room, I also want to just point out uh, how many opportunities there are to get involved in undergraduate research. This is Albert, he's an undergrad that works in our lab, helping with the development of these reactors. Um, and for the grad students in postdocs in the, in the room, um, this is also a really exciting opportunity for us to develop our mentorship skills and work with these really cool Caltech undergrads. That's all I've got to say. Um, just want to say one more time, welcome to Caltech, and I hope you guys have a really wonderful year here. So it strikes me every time I am involved in uh, one of these events or venues, uh, how consistently, uh, you know, as a, as a literary scholar, I often think of this in terms of the stories that institutions tell about themselves. You know, we, we tell ourselves a story about our intimacy and size, our collaborative spirit, um, our creativity, and you just see it borne out again and again in all of these presentations. So I hope uh, what you've heard today um, inspires you uh, as you depart on your Caltech journey. Um, I have no doubt that it uh, reinforces a sense that you made the right decision <laughs> in coming here and joining us. Um, so this is the end of our program today. I just want to ask you before we leave uh, to again uh, thank all of our uh, presenters, but also thank uh, the staff who were involved in making this event happen, sound, the video, uh, and particularly uh, to Michelle Rodriguez, I can't see from up here whether she's still here, who brought this all together and organized it. So welcome and uh, thank you.